My most wonderful childhood memories were the first eight years of my life spent in the love and care of my mother. She loved people. From very humble beginnings, from a poor farming village, she worked in a factory. She saved her pennies, she traveled Asia, and eventually she made her way to Canada. I remember poring over her fashion sketches and watching her work magic with her sewing machine. And then, when I turned eight, and she was 34, she was driving our family along a freeway, and our car collided head-on with another vehicle. And this impact left me with an occipital cervical dislocation with axial instability. In other words, the, the corresponding bones in my neck, in my neck became uh, separated from each other, and I was a fraction of a millimeter from not being able to walk ever again and not being able to move any part of my body from my chin below ever again. But it was my birthday, and doctors postponed telling me news about my mother until I was fitted with a halo brace with metal pins anchored to my skull. And at my bedside, where I was immobilized, and I was set to spend the next several months of my life, nurses told me that my mother's body had been recovered by the jaws of life from the ruins of our vehicle. She had sustained a severe brain trauma, and she was in a life-altering coma from which she never recovered. And back then, we knew so little about the brain, and even today, there is still so much we can learn. And since then, neuroscience, especially science of the brain, has become a personal passion of mine. And so it was my mother's tragedy that led me on this lifelong quest and fascination about this marvelous organ as an isolated object of inquiry. And today, I lead a nationwide mission to improve the care and outcome for brain injured patients. <clears throat> so. <coughs> Um, motor vehicle accidents are one of the most, of the most leading uh, causes of traumatic brain injury. And today we know that there are many brain states on the spectrum of consciousness. Consciousness itself is a multifaceted uh, concept that scientists have divided into two concepts. The concepts are awareness and wakefulness. Wakefulness is a state of arousal and gives it gives um, rise to conscious experience. Awareness, awareness is, uh, is, is, a, is something that describes a person's perception of self and their, and their surrounding environment. And you can appreciate then that when there is an increase of, of arousal, there is also a corresponding increase in conscious experience. And hence the two components are linearly correlated along the spectrum of consciousness. So along the normal physiological states of sleep, both awareness and wakefulness decline from what we call fully awake individuals like you and I. And when the two states, the two pathological, pathological states, the two awareness and wakefulness are dissociated and wakefulness is spared while awareness is impaired. These two states are, call, are what we call disorders of consciousness and they comprise both the vegetative state and the minimally conscious state. The vegetative state typically follows a coma, and the main difference between this and the minimally conscious state is one of conscious evidence. A minimally conscious patient has more definitive evidence of consciousness, and they are intermittently attentive and alert to themselves and also to their surrounding environment. A majority of patients recover from consciousness uh, after about several days after a coma and after their initial brain insult or their brain injury, and their condition evolves to the vegetative state that is sometimes irreversible for months and even decades. There are those who regain partial recovery and they surreptitio surreptitiously transition into the minimally conscious state and still others they emerge from this state and they go on to have a full recovery. 
Fascination with the topic of consciousness, though, is not new. Philosoph philosophers like Descartes have long appreciated this dualism between the brain and the mind, and modern science is dedicated to understanding the relationship between the self and also of the external world. While it can be impossible to know what is happening into the, in the minds of an unresponsive person, person with traumatic brain injury, technico technological brain imaging has allowed us to understand more about the brain and also about, in essence, to speak its language. So let me illustrate this by soliciting some audience participation. Suppose I ask you right now to close your eyes. And then I ask you to imagine yourself in your house and you're walking from room to room. You would have no problems doing that, right? Now suppose I asked you to keep your eyes closed and imagine yourself playing tennis. That is also an easy task, right? Right, so you would not need the visual cues that I have on the screen, and you would also not need to have experience on an actual tennis court to do these tasks. Now, let me share with you two recent experience, experiments rather, from two top neuroscience groups. Both use fMRI technology, functional magnetic resonance imaging technology, to image the brain. Now, the first one, here is a brain scan from Adrian Owen and his colleagues at Western. fMRI, I should tell you, measures brain activity by measuring the changes in blood flow during an activity, an active voluntary activity. These two figures here show a brain scan of a healthy, awake individual like you and me. And they were asked to perform the same task that I had asked you just to do. These two figures show the same tasks that were performed by a patient that was deemed vegetative. You can see that these veg this vegetative patient is able to perform the same task and activate the same area of the brain indistinguishable from the healthy volunteers. And so in, in, in consequence, hence this suggests that the patient was deemed vegetative, but he had already in advanced and, and surreptitiously evolved into a minimally conscious state that has a greater potential for recovery and also has a greater awareness than a vegetative state. Now let me share with you a clever corollary experiment, this time from Stephen Lowry's group at Liège. They, they studied a group of patients, uh, traumatic injury, injured patients, and also a group of healthy, healthy volunteers, and they also put, uh, used fMRI scanners and also asked them to perform the same tasks as, a, as, the, as this group here. But what they did different was they coupled this imagery task with a yes-no communicative response. So they asked their patients yes-no questions like, do you have a brother? Is your name Alexander? And then they said, if the answer is no, then couple that, imagine yourself navigating through your house. If the answer is yes, then you imagine yourself playing tennis. And you can see here that the patients were able to respond either no or yes by modulating their brain activity and generating a voluntary and also repeatable responses in the expected anatomical regions when they were prompted to do so by verbal command. So these findings demonstrate a preserved conscious awareness in patients deemed a vegetative and suggest also the capability to process language. To date, Doctors assess patients by observing their clinical behaviors and physical findings like eye-opening, reflexes, and also movements as well. And so it is a challenge to the untrained eye to differentiate between vegetative and minimally conscious state. And it's not surprising, given that these patients are too often viewed as hopeless, that they have often surreptitiously evolved into a minimally conscious state unnoticingly. Neuroscientists hope that brain imaging technology may have clinical applications to improve the patient care and to improve diagnosis and at the same time possibly to give patients a limited way of communicating with the outside world. But the media and the press have fueled 
widespread interest on the science of consciousness. And their headlines seem to suggest that doctors are already using brain imaging technology to talk to unconscious patients with brain trauma. Now, I'm excited that there is an increasing diversity of comment, critique, and productive uh, engagement in online media. But what the media does not mention is that there is a whole, is that these scientific initiatives have important ethical, legal, social, and technological challenges that have a profound impact on patient care. And as a consequence, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what is currently true about brain imaging and also what the future will look like as this research continues. Now, I'd like to give you a real life example on the ethical considerations that this poses. Let me introduce you to Terry Wallace. Terry Wallace was a 39-year-old Arkansas man who suffered from a motor vehicle accident in 1984 and was diagnosed as vegetative until he had what was described as a miracle awakening in 2003 when he spontaneously just began to speak. He began talking. Now, he was misdiagnosed as vegetative for 19 years, his true condition not being revealed or, or, or recognized until he emerged and recovered from a minimally conscious state. His fMRI scans show brain cell regrowth two decades after his injury. And this, what this illustrates is that the brain is capable and it can repair itself. It just doesn't do so well enough. And just to be clear, this is spontaneous recovery. Doctors didn't do anything. There was no invasive surgery. This is spontaneous recovery. And this is what we call neuroplasticity. Right. Now, physicians have a fiduciary duty to their patients for a proper diagnosis and hence appropriate recognition of futility. So if neuroimaging promotes diagnostic and normative clarity and it establishes prognosis for recovery, then what then are the challenges and why don't we offer brain scans to every patient, right? Well, first, there is a nagging discordance between behavioral findings and neuroimaging data. How do we correlate physical findings with those of neuroimaging? It's a pressing problem, and it is, and it, and it is a problem that cautions premature dissemination of this technology outside of the current research context, right? And also, there are many under uncertainties about what a lack of response means from a patient. In the experiment that I told you before about the yes, with the yes-no communication, they studied 54 patients of traumatic brain injury. And most remarkably, only one out of the four vegetative patients responded in that way, the yes-no way. Right. So a failure to get a response is actually ambiguous in meaning. It, 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 it's ambiguous. It could mean that the patient was distracted. It could mean that the patient was too fatigued to respond or they didn't understand the question. It could mean that um, they, were, they needed more time to produce an answer. It's just ambiguous. It doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't uh, produce, a, it doesn't, there's no conclusive evidence of what an, a, a failure of a response means. So we need to be careful not to undermine the prior expressed wishes for these patients based on these incomplete or inconclusive neuroimaging data, right? So if a patient articulated or they articulated their prior expressed wishes or they completed an advanced directive prior to losing their um, capacity for uh, decision making, then their prior wishes should be the one that guides care. We need to be careful to determine when these neuroimaging techniques are appropriate, in what clinical conditions they are appropriate, and should we continue to ask questions only based on their patient preferences, or should we expand that into questions about whether or not, um, uh, whether or not they want to donate their organs after death or if they are ready to die, right? Now, these ambiguous outcomes should not erode the patient's right to determine how they want to live and also how they want to die. Thank you.